Homeland Security or FBI and say, oh, uh, why? I met the best guys at the service and this morning. We took a cup of coffee, maybe I'll learn something. We both took the same oath. You know, to defend the Constitution against all of these foreign and domestic. I don't recall her being there next duration day on that. So it will end up the show. I'll tell you, we need to change. We need to change. We need to change. We need to change. another edition of the Free American. I'm your host, I'm Clay Douglas. Let's see if we can uh, get uh, my other radio. All right, it's ringing now. We'll bring up Crusade. Welcome everybody from Truth Radio, Blog Talk Radio, and Crusade Radio. My guest today is Peter Kling. Letters from To Earth. You Can Survive Armageddon is his book. That's uh, linked up on my website. His website is linked uh, on freeamerican.com. Peter, I am really excited to have you on. Uh, it's, uh, there's so many areas I want to explore. And you've got, them, you've got most of them uh, up on your website. It's like we've been talking about the same things for many years. Is this synchronicity, or is God alive and well on the internet? I said maybe, uh -oh. maybe, maybe well, burning bushes are just a little passe today. So it's the 21st century. Why wouldn't God use the internet? You know, you bring up a very good point. <laughs> I was taught the scriptures. Now I never learned religion. I never learned religious dogma. I had to go. Well, I shouldn't say I never learned it. I had to go learn that on my own. I had to go learn what the Catholics believe, Protestants, the different sects, the Hindus, Buddhists. But I was never taught religion, and they started teaching me the Bible from the age before I was five years old. I was taught the exopolitics of the scriptures. Now there's a little bit of a different slant. What do you mean exopolitics of the scriptures? Well, what did Jesus tell us? He said, I will return to set up my kingdom here on earth. What did he tell Pilate before he left? My kingdom is no part of this earth or of this world. For if it was, my followers would have delivered me up. You see, here's the situation. We're in a world now that we know that UFOs exist. We know that extraterrestrials exist. We know that we are not being told the truth by the government. We know that we've been enslaved. If you don't believe that, you know, you'll find out every April 15th when you've got to pay your taxes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we probably have another month to work. No, let's see, this is, we're starting June. We should have just about paid our taxes for the year. It takes about five months to pay your taxes in the United States. So now the rest of the year, we can work to pay our bills and pay for our food and maybe have a little left over for entertainment. But yeah, it takes, it takes about five months just to pay your taxes. Is that enslavement? Well, I do go by the name Free American because I told them uh, almost uh, 20 years ago I would not file another income tax. I'm not paying. They're nothing but crooks and... I'm not volunteering no more. Well, you see, now, you bring up a very good point, Clayton. Crooks. The whole world is corrupt. It's not 
are they corrupt or not. It's how much are they corrupt. And the corruption goes right to the top. It goes right to the Vatican, right to the Queen of England, right to the Pope, right to the Prince. You mean, you mean those, uh, excuse me, you mean those uh, three uh, entities that you just mentioned there who have just been indicted by a common, law, a common law court in uh, Brussels for... Well, it's except for the abomination, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, two popes and, and the queen have been indicted in child in abuses uh, against uh, crimes against humanity they've been indicted in child trafficking all three of them uh, the previous Pope Benedict who some say is still actually in power uh, he's got a lot more on his plate than that he's involved in child sacrifice as well as the Queen go do the research Kevin and that uh, ITT, ITCC I believe is the uh, yes, dot com is the uh, website yes sir I put uh Kevin's interviews up on my Facebook site. I've certainly been following that. You know, I, I've also suggested that maybe, maybe we've actually been in Armageddon for the last hundred years because uh, more more people have been slaughtered or uh, killed on Earth in that time by their own governments, most of them, than any any point before in history. Uh, maybe maybe the media just didn't tell us we were. Uh, being uh, killed and sacrificed hundreds of millions of people, maybe a billion or more people, have died at the hands of their own governments in uh, Russia and China, and I think maybe more in the United States than we even imagine if you add in the abortions, if you add in the uh, uh, the heart attacks, the uh, insanity that uh, uh, and we're being poisoned. I mean, that comes out of the Bible too. They poison people. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's just so many places we can start, but uh, I always find it best to start at the beginning. Uh, okay. Um, Clayton, just just my own sanity here and, and uh, putting together a quick story. How long do we have on the air? We've got as long as you want, sir. Two hours right now. Huh. Okay. I just have to adjust the information for, for the amount of time because I can go on for four hours if I have to. But that's, it usually takes about that length of time to cover everything, but we'll do it in a, in a brief version of it. Uh, we, now, I will bring you back. I will have you uh, on my shows in the future, Peter. I think this, uh, this information is vital. And, and I have told, I've been telling my audience, man, the uh, money changers that Jesus ran out of the temple, there's no such thing as the New World Order, because the money changers Jesus ran out of the temple are still with us. They just changed the name of the temple. They call it the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund now. Okay, well, here, here's, here's, let's, let's address this real quick. Okay. I agree with you about the okay? Okay. Now, when it, 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 turn to the book of Acts, the seventh chapter, and this is the account of the disciple Stephen before the Jewish high court, before the Sanhedrin. And when you go down to the 42nd and 43rd verse, I'm going to paraphrase this here, uh, Stephen quotes the prophet Amos. And he's talking to the, to the ruling class of Judea at this point, the rulers, those who, make, who uphold the law, the Supreme Court. And he says, Was it to me, O Israel, to whom you worshipped those forty years in the wilderness? No, it was to the tent of Molech and to the uh, star of the god Raphan, to whom you made sacrifices and made images to and worship. And for that, I will send you far beyond Babylon. Now, who is this Molech? Well, the first Molech, what, actually, the name Molech, it actually means, it's a term, it means terrible God. And when you do the history on Molech, the first one was the god Set, S-E-T, of Egypt. He was a homosexual, a bisexual god who demanded child, live child sacrifice. The most prominent Molech, terrible god, is the god Baal. Baal was a fertility god in the spring. Who uh, they were the uh, people who worshipped Baal would hold these fantastic or orgies, and they'd be drunk and doing hallucinogenics and be out of their minds and engaging in all sexual activities. And then those women who became pregnant 
uh, well, they would offer their first fruits up to Molech in the terrible god in the fall. And so they would take their newborn children that were conceived during the orgy and they would throw them while alive into a burning fire. They had a statue of Molech. He was a, uh, a man's body with a bull's head sitting on a throne and there was a fire in its lap that was stoked from underneath and they would throw the babies right into the fire and to cover over the screaming they would have drums beating during the ceremony. Now, uh, is Molech still with us today? Look up in your computer Star of Molech or Star of Raphen. I'll spell them M-O-L-E-C-H also sometimes M-O-L-O-C-H Molech or Moloch and it's Raphen and sometimes Rumpfin, R-U-M-P-H-A-N or R-E-M-P-H-A-N. Go look up those stars and you'll find out who we're sacrificing our children to. That would be the uh, six uh, points on the star, the six triangles. I believe that uh, that adds up to 666 when you look at yeah, all that, of the... Yeah, that's, uh, that's the star of Moloch. And King David would have killed anyone wearing that symbol. Now, I wrote a book about a character that came back by the name of Solomon. And in my little science fiction novelette, it was uh, the Jews thought he was the Messiah. The uh, Christians thought he was the Antichrist. And uh, what he was, uh, I won't even go into that right now because I haven't published a book yet, but, uh, you know, Jesus warned us about the Jews who say they're Jews, but are not are of the synagogue of Satan. Isn't that ah, the synagogue of Set? three, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, here's the thing, and, and I, I, I wrote about this in Let Us Earth, You Can Survive Armageddon. This is not an anti-Semitic comment. I have lots of friends that just happen to be Jewish. Hey, Congratulations. Some of them are actually Christian Jews. You know, it's interesting. I've got friends of all faiths, of all colors, of all nationalities around the world. Uh, we're all from the same family, and the sooner we figure that out, the sooner we'll stop killing each other. I've told people I don't care who your grandmother slept with. That makes no difference to me. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and it all, but it all goes back to, to that point. Now, you see, if, if you think this is a, that saying something against Zion, and it's not Jews, it's Zionism. I have a good friend of mine. His name's Vahid. But he goes by his Jewish name, Joshua. His mother was Jewish, his father's Iranian. And I asked him, you know, after we first met, this is going back about 15 years ago, I said, I said, Josh, I said, tell me the truth. What in the world's going on over in the Middle East? He said, Peter, it's all politics. He said, the Jews and the, uh, and the Arabs, yeah, we've, been we've been living in peace forever. So we don't have any problems. It's, it, it, it's all the politics. I was watching the Glenn Beck show about 10 years ago. It was actually the last time I watched Glenn Beck. And this is when Hamas was launching rockets into uh, Jerusalem from Lebanon, and, uh, or into Israel, I should say. And uh, they brought on a, a Hasidic Jew, you know, a gentleman, you know, he had the hat, the, the curly hair, and, and, and the black coat. And uh, Beck said, well, what do you think about, you know, what's going on in Israel? And this Hasidic Jewish man said, it's all Zionism's fault. He said, and Beck went nuts. Beck went nuts. Go look up on the Internet, Jews Against Zionism, and you'll start to get the understanding. Carter, Zionism is the Carter, worship is, of Molech. That's Nutra Carta, isn't it? I'm sorry? Nutra Carta is the Jewish group. I believe they're out of Australia. They, uh, I was the only magazine in the country that put pictures of 10,000 of them marching in Washington, D.C., protesting the Zionist state of Israel. Yeah, and you, uh, and you know, you go back to, but let's just look at recent history here. You go back to the end of this last summer when all this problem came up with Syria and these chemical weapons and so forth, and we know that that, that uh, it wasn't uh, President Assad and his people uh, using the hold weapons. On just it, it was the rebels that were using the weapons. Hold on uh, just a second here. Let me uh, take, somebody's calling in on my show. I don't usually take calls, 
Let me just see who this is. Maybe a bill collector, but hold on just a moment. Hello, 506 area code. I'm live on the air. Who are you? What do you want? Oh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Douglas, uh, can you give me the phone number of John Kaminsky? I just was listening to your... No, uh, sir. No, your, sir. Uh, I cannot. I, I'm sorry, sir. Memorial Day. No, sir. I do not do that. You can send him an email. I do not give out any of my guest phone numbers. Thank you. Listen to the show that we're doing oh. today. Thank you for your call. Back, back, back to work. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, we, we, we'll, sorry we'll about that. Uh, well, we're, ta we're talking about the Jews who say they're Jews but are not or of the synagogue of yeah. say uh, they, uh, that uh, that would be the uh, Zionist. These are, uh, I mean, these these people uh, are are they just the Pharisees uh, in uh, this uh, this century or what? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, exactly, and who who are those who Jesus attacked the most? They were the Pharisees. Go read the scriptures. Everything you need to know is in the Bible, but that's the problem. It's only the stuff you need to know. And people say, well, the Bible's been tampered with. Yeah, you know what the biggest problem with the Bible is? They took the name of God out. They took the name of Yahweh or Jehovah from the Bible. And then why, why is that a big deal? It's extremely important because there's so many scriptures, like in Acts 2.21, all those calling on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. It's like when Moses went before Pharaoh and he said, Yahweh said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, who is this Yahweh that I should let his people go? Well, he found out. It took ten plagues, but he found out. Well, guess what? It's Exodus time here, folks. We are in the middle of the plagues. And people don't realize that. But the question is, you see, they took God's name out of the Bible. So when you have to go, when there's an emergency and it's a life-dealing situation, who do you call on? Who is this Yahweh that I should call on to save my life? You had better learn that. Now, let's start right there, right smack in the beginning. Who is this Yahweh? Well, when you go to Revelation, in his own words, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Before me, nothing existed, and after me, nothing will exist. Scientists tell us that we live in a ten-dimensional multiverse. In order for our three dimensions to be here, there needs to be seven other dimensions. Now, the interesting thing is, those seven other dimensions can do just fine without our three dimensions. But if those, seven, if those other seven dimensions aren't there, we do not exist. Now, there's been a lot of research that's gone into string theory, M theory, and now super string theory, where there can actually be an unlimited amount of dimensions. It doesn't have to stop, according to the mathematics. But let's reduce it down to the, down to the most simple. And that's basically that there needs to be ten dimensions in order for us to, be, to exist, including, uh, uh, plus the dimension of time. So eleven dimensions all, all total. There could be more. Most likely there are. There's the dimension of Tartarus, where the uh, uh, fathers of the Nephilim were, are being kept. That is a dimension unto itself. Uh, but here we are in this ten-dimensional world. Now, interesting. The Bible gives the number of ten as being human complete, earthly complete, the physical world being complete. The divine number we know is seven. Oh, isn't that a coincidence? Seven and three make ten. We need the divine, the other seven dimensions, within our very souls in order to exist. As a matter of fact, that's where we come from. But now here's the question. Who is this Yahweh? Well, physics tells us something. We have to look at physics. See, you can't just look at religion because religion doesn't give you any answers. The Bible does. Religion doesn't. Religion does nothing but tell you lies. Uh, but everything you need to know and only the stuff you need to know is written in the scriptures. So, who is this Yahweh? Well, we know in the, one of the first laws of physics is that you can neither create nor destroy energy. You can only transform it. Like when you light a match, you are taking the energy that's stored up in the chemicals on the match head and you are oxidizing them and burning up the cardboard and paper along with it. In actuality, what you get is light, heat, and more weight when you're done because you, uh, you, cause you went through the process of oxidation than just the old match itself if you were to re put all the components back together. So we transform the energy of this static match into several different forms, heat, light, and other uh, physical parts of energy. Well, now, if nothing existed before Yahweh, 
and you cannot create nor destroy energy, then at one point there must have been nothing but pure dynamic energy. Energy in its most pure form or state. And we have to believe that this energy is con was conscious because we're conscious. And we have to believe also that the energy was intelligent because we're intelligent. So what turned this pure dynamic energy into everything that's around us today, including who we call Yahweh? This energy had to have a clue. It had to come up with a concept. It had to have a fantastic idea one day, and it did. It came up with the concept of love. Wow, what a concept. It works on every level. You can love your dog, you can love your kids, you can love your car, you can love your house, you can love your grandparents, you can love your parents, you can love your family, you can love that significant other like no one else can. Would you mind if I define that? The more that? you get, the better you feel. It's, always, it, it, it's one big go-around. Would, I, would uh, you uh, mind if I that, define that for you? Sure, go ahead. Your level of vibrational energy. And the more you love, the closer to God you are. I've also told my audience, if you're omnipotent and omnipotent, you know everything, you can do anything, and you're the only one of your kind in the universe, actually you are the universe, what are you? And, you know, the, the answer I get um, consistently is, well, uh, you're, you're God. You know everything, you can do anything, you're God. I said, what else? What else? I would think you would have to be bored to tears, you know? So, what do you do? If you're the only one of your kind in the universe, who provides your intrigue? Who provides your romance? Who provides your excitement? Uh, oh, well, let's create man, put a spark of our divinity, uh, my divinity in him that they'll call the soul, they'll call the conscious, they'll call ESP. And then, as Shakespeare said, the whole world becomes a stage. I, the God sits behind your eyes and my eyes, and we've got free will, so we can decide whether we want to be good or evil. Ah, you said a key point. Free will and deciding whether we want to be good or evil. We're going to take a look at that in just a second. Matt. Now, before, well, just a few minutes ago, uh, a few seconds ago, you said oh. that we need, we are in our own way, and when we pray, it brings us closer to God. It brings us actually closer to dad who's you know part of our family because what does it say in genesis god said let us make man in our image our plural who is he talking to well go to john book of john first chapter the word the word was with god and the word was a god and all things came into the world through the word it was a god now we better know him as jesus because that's who john was talking about but he's also known as Michael the Archangel. And he's also currently known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His exact name is not given to us yet. But it's the same entity. Now, you see, the first thing that happened, and picture, picture cellular division. You know, if you have nothing but pure dynamic energy, and that energy starts to transform itself, well, the first thing it has to do is break a piece of it off and change it into something else. It's cellular division. And so, through cellular division, you have the firstborn, the Word, the first creation of this divine, dynamic, pure energy, the God particle, which we look for at the, at the Hadron Collider. They search and they believe they found it. The God particle. It's there. No joke, it's there. Because we're made in His image. Now, when you read, here's the, the prime directive for the planet Earth, but it goes further. We'll cover that by the end of the show. The prime directive. God said, let us make man in our image. So in his image, he made them male and female. And he told them, prime directive, folks, fruitful, become many, and fill the earth. Having subjection to the fish of the sea, the animals of the earth, and all things bearing seed are good to eat. Goodbye, I'm going to bed. End of the sixth day, the beginning of the seventh, the rest day of Yahweh. Interesting. So God rests, he goes to bed. Now, if you're with a significant other and you go to bed, what do you do? Hmm, make love? Possibly. Now, let's, let's use that premise. Because he said, be fruitful, become many. What was the last command? He said before he went, took a rest, go have kids. Make me some grandkids. Well, now, who are we dealing with? We were dealing, when you read what it says about Adam, 
It says that Adam was created from the dust of the ground. Adam was the first original star child, made from the elements of the stars. And into his nostrils was put the breath of life, enter the soul of Yahweh. And so, as it says in Genesis 5, when one dies, the soul I will require back from each per, each individual with containing blood. So it was a command given to given blood. At the end of after uh, Genesis nine five is uh, after the deluge, uh, Noah and his ark, you know, Noah gets out of the ark, and and he goes to sacrifice uh, an animal to to God uh, because of, of being survived. And God said, now you can eat meat, but you have to drain its blood because the blood belongs to me. It says it, it, within the blood is somehow is our soul and alive and drain their blood. But in the blood is the soul, and the soul, God says quite plainly, I will require back the soul from man. From every living thing, I will require back its soul. So when we die, guess where our soul goes? Yeah. Back to the Creator. Is that the end of it? Maybe, maybe not. Stay tuned, there's more to come. Uh... A lot of people think, oh, well, we've been incarnating on this planet for, for thousands of years. Well, wait a minute. If we only started out with two, how do we wind up with seven billion if we all just reincarnate? Shouldn't there still just be the original two? Oh, they had kids. Well, who reincarnated through the kids? You see, we are all the original perfect pair were put on this planet to create perfect individuals with perfect DNA. Now, let's go back to, to the account. It, had that happened, it would be a very interesting thing. Now, the next thing we know, okay, Adam is made from the dust of the stars. But where does Eve come from? God said it's not good that the man is, is, uh, is alone. I'm going to create a helper for him. So he causes a sleep to come over the man. He opens up his, uh, the flesh. He removes a rib. Uh, the, the lower ribs regenerate. And uh, he builds a woman. He makes a woman. And he brings the woman before the man, and the man says, At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one was taken from man. I will call her a woman. She is my clone. This is the first evidence, or the first record, I should say, of genetic engineering. When you remove a tissue sample from a living organism and then take that tissue sample to create a second living organism, that is genetic engineering. We learned to do that in the 1960s because we finally, after 5, 000, almost 6,000 years, figured out what DNA was in 1953. So we couldn't have, st our science did not catch up to the science of the scriptures, or start to catch up to the science of the scriptures, until the 20th century. How about that? How about that? So we could never start to understand the scriptures until the 1960s. Truly. So who are these genetic engineers? Let us make man in our image. You see, who's the us? Now, is God some guy that rides around in a rocket ship or a UFO or something? No. Let's take a look at fractal technology. Fractal technology is the reoccurrence of patterns that we find in nature. Take a look at a fern. Take a look at, at coral. Take a look at a lot of things. You take a leaf off of a tree and then back up and hold that. If you're in a field, back up and hold that leaf up and look at the tree. The leaf is basically the same shape as the tree does. Take an aspen tree leaf and look at an aspen uh, tree. Take a maple leaf and look at a maple leaf tree. Take an oak leaf look at an oak tree. It's fractal technology. Now, the interesting thing. Uh, we are basically fractals of our creator. We are the same thing in a smaller version. It's the repeating of nature. Now, what do you mean? We're little gods? Yeah, think about this. We've got roughly 7 billion, a little over 7 billion people running around the face of the planet. Cool. Uh, but there are, we know, the science has told us there are trillions of planets based on the hundreds of billions of galaxies, each having hundreds of billions of stars. Do the math. 
So we know that there are trillions of planets, 20% of which are Earth-like planets, are in the Earth habitable zone. Does that mean that there are more humans around the Earth? No. I mean, around the universe? No. Earth is the starting place. Everything's got a starting place. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, so here, who are the genetic engineers? We'll get to that. The next thing that kind of happens is he's wa is walking around in the garden, and a serpent approaches her, and he says, Hey, sweetie, uh, is it true that you're not allowed to eat from, uh, any of the fruit from the trees of the garden? And he says, Oh, no. You see, the serpent raises a question, and it's a false question. He says, No, we can eat from, the tr from all the trees except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, from, because if we eat from that, we'll die. And the serpent says, nah, God says, God knows that if you eat from that tree, you're going to be like, if you eat from the fruit from that tree, you're going to be just like God. You'll know good and bad. And he thinks about it. It's cool. So now what happens? They eat the fruit. Now, up until this point, they were running around naked. Didn't care. Didn't have a care of the world. Everything was good. They ate the fruit, and they realized they were naked. What's the next thing that happened? They hear the voice of God. Hello? Oh, it's Raya. And they hide themselves. Well, first they make leave flying cloths, and then they hide themselves. They become afraid. What happened here? The human brain has four different operating speeds. Beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Now, Clayton, you said, you know, we need to pray to get close to God. When you pray and meditate, you go from the beta operating speed into the alpha operating speed. When we love, we go into alpha. You cannot love very well in beta. The beta operating speed is where the fight or flight response is. You want to fight? Come on. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. No, 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 no. I'm okay. Uh, bye. And then you run away. You see, that's where that response is. I'll guarantee you, there's no man on the front line of any war that's sitting there in Alpha. If he ain't in Beta, he's dead, or he's praying, one or the other. I mean, if he, yeah, if he ain't in Beta, he's dead, or he's... Uh, the only way he can be in Alpha is if he's praying to God, save me! <laughs> it's the only way he can be in Alpha. But that's where the fight and flight response is. Now, when you go into Alpha, it goes above 16, like a down to or around. Um, five cycles per second somewhere there maybe eight depending on that, how you're actually functioning and there is where we start to we pray, we meditate, we'll daydream and you know, if you're going on vacation you think you sit back and ah, the sandy shore, the smell of the sea water, the salt water uh, um, you know your favorite drink in a long tall glass uh, you have all these visions that you're painting in your mind about how you're going to that's all done in Alpha See? The next level down is theta. Now, to get into theta, you have to really relax and slow your brain down even more because theta, you, you're going to run from about 10 down to 4 cycles per second. And in theta, you can do remote viewing. If anyone knows about the work of the Farsight Far Institute, they all do their work in theta. You can see any point in time within your mind's eye, forward or backward in history, and in any dimension you choose to look, as long as you know where to look, you know where to go find things. You ever go look for your keys? Ah, where did I leave my keys? I can't remember where they are. Uh, well, if you don't know what you're looking for to begin with, how are you ever going to know where to find it? But if you're ever really having a hard time finding your keys, just stop for a second, go into Alpha, and then slide down into Theta and think about, and then go look at your keys. Just picture your keys, visualize them in your mind, and then guess what? Back up. You see those keys? Oh, then you back up. Ah, they're on the bookshelf. Ha <laughs> ha! Okay, let me go get them. You can do that. And it works in everything. When you go down beyond that, you go into delta. Delta is from zero to four cycles per second. If you are in delta, you are in deep sleep. And delta is where we have lucid dreams, where we, they seem so real like we're there. We have out-of-body experiences. I had a great out of box experience several times, a couple of them, unfortunately. Uh, but one of them was really fantastic. Uh, the circumstances weren't too good. I was in a coma. I was in a coma in Westchester County Hospital, Westchester, New York. And while in a coma, an 
entity came to me and said, come with me. And instantly I was whisked away. My consciousness was whisked away. And the next thing I know, I'm watching the birth of my youngest child. And as soon as the, the child was born, boom, I was back in my body. And I remember laying there in a coma. It's not like a dream. Uh, wow, that was so cool. I'm a, I'm a dad. And I remember feeling happy. I remember, well, some hours later, I came out of the coma. And I looked up and who's standing there? But my mom. And the first words out of my mouth were, Ma, go make a phone call. The baby was born. That woman had the most confused look I've ever seen on her face. She was just totally confused. She's watching her son, who was near death, just comes out of a coma, and, and the first words out of his mouth are, for me to go make a phone call? What the heck's going on here? Uh, the next time, she said, but she said, okay, and she went away. And I, I, I went unconscious again when I came to. Again, there she was standing on top of me again, and she said, congratulations, you have a son. Now, I got to see that. I got to see that firsthand. But what's even more cool is that an entity came and got me to go take me there to see it. I don't know if people say, oh man, he just gets guys but yep, I can tell you some more things that make you think that I've lost my mind, but they've all been true and they can be documented. Well, you know, Peter, that's happened to me. I've died at least three times and had pretty much the same experience. The, the only thing I'm confused about <laughs> I don't know whether I got kicked out of heaven or uh, banned from hell. I don't. I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, you, you see, that's why we're here, Clayton. Uh, we, we're too good for hell, and heaven doesn't want us. <laughs> the, the entity, the entity that you're talking about, told me, "Get back in that body, man. You're not done here. You're not through. You've got work to do." And yeah, the I, next I, thing I, I knew, I, I, and I was yeah. I was floating above I was floating above my body, looking at my body, laying on the bed. And uh, did uh, I, have, and, I, what? Have, I have a question for you? Go please, ahead, sir. But this is important. Uh, when that happened, well, you were experiencing that. Did you feel anything pulling you? I was uh, going down the tunnel. Uh, the uh, actually, the first time it happened to me. I uh, had caught spinal meningitis in the Army. I was in an Army hospital, and they sent a telegram out to my mother saying that I wasn't expected to make it. They didn't think I was going to live. And they told me my mother was coming. So I went down that tunnel to the light. I saw the light, and I heard footsteps, and I turned around and came back. Second time it happened to me, they told me, no, get back in the body. You're not, you're not done here. Your work's certainly not done. Now, here's the reason I ask. Is that there have been 14 times that I should have been dead since I was 18. Uh, interesting, I had alien contact just shortly after. Actually, almost 40 years ago, almost exactly 40 years ago, it's like in the next week or two, uh, it was the beginning of June, the end of May, the beginning of June, just after my 18th birthday, that I had alien contact, and it lasted, it, it would happen, it had several nights over the course of maybe about a week, and they were taking me to this underground, I, I felt like I was in the bottom of a castle, everything was all stone, except the ceilings just lit up the room, and what they didn't have like, you know, lights there, with the ceilings lit up the room, and they, they looked very much, uh, but the visit that I had, where I was taken, I was in this room with about 70 other of these creatures, and one of them got up in front of the room and said, uh, can I have your attention? And everybody stopped talking, and we moved forward, and he said, I need someone to kill Peter Kling. And someone down close to I, my jaw dropped, and I looked to my, my guide who was next to him. I said, why do they want to kill me? And, and, and he said, because you crossed the line very coldly and very matter-of-factly. And I didn't know what, what he was talking about. Well, when I was 18 years old, the Vietnam War was going on. I was classified as one holding. Uh, they were waiting for me to graduate high school. Come on, boy. Uh, you're number 26 this year in the draft lottery. You're going to the front line. Uh, thank goodness uh, President Nixon put a hold on the draft. That's the only way I didn't uh, wind up going in. But I was against the war. I was, a, you know, an 18-year-old rebel. Um, didn't like anything that was going on particularly. And here I'm being recruited 
by extraterrestrials to be a channeler for them for their coming to do whatever they plan on doing in the future. And I wouldn't channel. I wouldn't play. I crossed the line. I stayed true to my education. I always suspected these creatures of not being legitimate. Now, uh, uh, it was about uh, three weeks, four weeks after that, after they told me they were going to kill me, I was involved in a motorcycle accident that should have killed me. Three months after that, I was involved in a car accident that should have killed me. Here I am, 18 years old, and the aliens are missing. <laughs> it's like, I saw you guys can't get me. You know, a cocky young kid. Well, over the years, I've been busted up pretty good. So, uh, the last time was, was quite amazing. I, I walked away unscathed, which was great. But the one time when they did get me, I was being wheeled down a hospital corridor. And I was in my body. I couldn't speak, couldn't say anything. All I could do was move my eyes. And the next thing I knew, I was out of my body watching them wheel me down a hospital corridor. And I'm thinking, no, no, I, this can't, you know, I knew what was happening. I know I was in trouble, but I couldn't, it was like a state of kind of like panic. Uh, but it, it, it was like beyond control. It was like, how do I, I can't let them know that, the, that, I'm, that there's a problem. And next thing I know, I'm looking at my body and I'm like, I don't, I just got my life in order. I just got married. I just had a kid. I, I don't, you know, I had all these reasons not to go. <laughs> but I didn't have a whole lot of choice. And I kept on being pulled further and further away from my body. Now, I noticed that I was, my consciousness was enveloped in almost like a cloud substance. In an energy that was like, kind of like a cloud. And it was just the smallest little wisp of it coming out of my chest. But when I changed my focus, I noticed that this energy that I was con my consciousness was contained in was connected to the great white light. And it was pulling me in. It was like I was in a tractor beam. Right. And it was pulling me straight, straight into it. And then, you know, I, I, the, the protest kind of stopped. And I'm like, well, I guess, you know, I'm going to find out what, <laughs> find out what this is all about, what heaven's all about, and where we're going. It's obviously not a hell experience. Uh, I'm headed to the great white light. And all of a sudden, everything stopped. And I started being pushed back away from the, from the white light. And I was put back in my body. I, uh, I can't tell you how long the whole process was from beginning to end, but I know I dreamt dr dreams like you wouldn't believe, most of which were all prophetic, uh, some of which took 10 years to happen. So that, that was a very interesting experience for me. And it, it, no two people that I, I... I've never talked to anybody that's had the same experience as I have, and I've never heard two, two experiences of people that have tasted death. Uh, no two are the same. We're, we're as individual as fingerprints, so God deals with us individually in, in, our own, in, in a way that we need to be dealt with. Right. That's the only conclusion that I can come up with. But here's the thing: we're all, we're still connected. Now we uh, we were talking about fractal technology, and and, and we got this little near death experience uh, segment in here. But now here's the thing: we got seven billion people on this planet, over seven billion people. Seven plus all the other different life forms. Now let's take a look at our own bodies. How many different life forms are our bodies host to? We have critters from the top of our heads to the bottom of our toes, inside and out, from our lips to our butt. We are filled with life forms that help keep us running, that help keep us all happy little individuals. Some of them eat parts of the dead skin, some of them eat bacteria that are floating around, some bacteria kill viruses. We, we, we've got other parts that, that you know, we got viruses that, that are fighting in our bodies right now, and the bacteria is, you know, killing the, you know, different parts of the white blood cells attacking this, and, and there's a little wars going on in our own body. Hopefully, we're not faced with the big war of cancer, because once a cell goes cancerous, if it's not isolated and dealt with immediately, it can kill the body, just kind of like what's happening here on planet Earth. What's had? That's why it's known as a prison planet. It's gone cancerous. If what has happened here is allowed to infect those billions of planets, hundreds of billions of Earth-like planets across the, gal across the universe, there's no telling how much it will kill the body of Yahweh.
You see, this cancer will kill. And so if Yahweh allows the cancer to infect his body, seeing as we are fractals, we are cells within the body of the God that we think that we are, that we know we're part of. You see, when all tied together, you look at those ten dimensions, and if nothing exists but pure dynamic energy and it's scattered across all ten dimensions, we are literally within the body of God. And so when we pray, we are connecting into the body of God, of Yahweh. That's why no man can see God and yet live, as the scriptures say. You want to see God? You got to die. Sorry, folks, because you got to leave the physical world behind. The scriptures say, blood and flesh cannot inherit God, the kingdom of the heavenly kingdom of God. I don't no, know why everybody no wonder, wants to be raptured. No wonder. Raptured means you die and you get and your soul goes back to God. Have a good trip. I promise I will not see you after Armageddon. At least not alive. No wonder uh, the church's religiosity. They want you to be afraid of death. They want you to be afraid of God. I've said, why Why should I be afraid of my father? You know, I, 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 I have a hard time understanding that. Fear not those who kill the body but cannot destroy the soul. But fear him. And I mean a healthy fear. I mean like, oh, he's going to kill my body and soul. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul. You know, you know I did a if, you, if, you go back to, if you go back to the creator in your soul form, in your spirit form, and you have that oneness with God, like he's your father, you're happy to see your father. But if you are afraid of those who have who don't care anything about the God figure or the Creator or Yahweh, then you really don't have any trust or faith in your father, do you? You see, then you're a victim. Stop being a victim. Go into Alpha. When we go back to the original account with Adam and Eve, you see, they were in Alpha. They had that connection with God. They had free will. Hey, free will in a state of love works great. Free will in a fight and flight state, you have a problem. So now there was something contained in, in that fruit. My belief is that that fruit contained a virus. That fruit contained a virus which, when ingested, erased our divine part of our DNA unraveled it. Now we got mostly junk that they don't know what it all is. But you know what? They figured it out. Our DNA, one cell, one human cell with one perfect DNA component. That complete strand of DNA holds all the information for all life that ever existed on this planet. You take one human cell and recreate life on another planet right from the start. One of my guests, uh, I believe you may know, David Koss. He uh, did farm physics. He talks about spinning your water. And uh, he wanted to know if uh, there's uh, what the difference is uh, between the Antichrist, A-N-T-I Christ, and the Ante Christ, A-N-T-E Christ. I'm not... The, the spelling... But that, I, you know, let's just cover the Antichrist real quick. Okay. Jesus talked about the oh, the Antichrist talked about the first century. Jesus said, "Oppressive wolves are going to enter into the flock after I'm gone," and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, Re so repeat that. For, this, repeat it, that for uh, me, uh, Peter. Repeat that. What you just said. Repeat that. Uh, he said, "Oppressive wolves will enter the flock after I am gone." Okay. Now. Jesus, let's go back and, and talk about this for a minute. You see, Jesus never intended to start a religion. It goes back to government. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, think about this, okay? What was one of, what did, the last temptation of Christ was Satan, or Lucifer, or actually his title was, according to Ezekiel, the covering cherub of Eden. You want to know who the genetic engineers were for the third dimension? 
we'll, we'll talk about the cover of Cherub of Eden a little bit more. But this, this covering Cherub of Eden, Lucifer, takes Jesus to this unusually high spot, and he shows him the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms, the government. He said, all these are yours. I'll give them to you for an act of worship. And Jesus said, go away, Satan, it is Yahweh alone you must worship. And the conversation with that, that was, that was the end of the testing. But it was all political. It had nothing to do with religion. It was politics. And in this, and that's why I was taught exopolitics from the time I was a young child. I was taught to be an ambassador to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, let me stop you right there. One of the things that, uh, one of the quotes of Jesus that I really uh, appeals to me is that he said, you can do what I do and more. And at the Council of Nicaea, I think that's 350 A.D., I said, did they promote Jesus to God to keep men like you and I from aspiring to be the kind of man he was when he walked the earth? You know, there's been a lot of controversy over the Council of Nicaea. And for those folks who don't know, the Council of Nicaea is where they basically put the biblical canon together. Uh, but you have to look at who commissioned this. This was commissioned by um, um, Emperor Constantine, who was a Mithra worshiper. Emperor Constantine, the story goes, was baptized on his deathbed. Well, when Jesus was baptized, he was put under the, uh, the waters of the Jordan River, completely emerged. I don't think that the little sprinkling of water that they did uh, that the church carries out now counts as much of a baptism personally but that's neither here nor there we're looking at uh, the, the religious aspect of, of the Bible when you look at all of the holidays which are celebrated today in the name of Christianity they all have roots in paganism even the so-called birth of Christ on the 25th of December is indeed the celebration of the holiday Saturnalia. The god Saturn, also known as Rumphin or Raphin, the star god. The same god, Molech. Now, what about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? The god in the Old Testament seemed to me to be a little bit more bloodthirsty than the uh, God of Jesus. Yep. And who was he battling? All of the pagan gods around him. So his people had to conquer all the other pagan gods, starting with the world power of Egypt. Who is this Yahweh that I should let his people go? You're going to find out real soon. I promise you that. I promise you that because we're already in the blood, the, the tetrad blood moons. The moon will be turned to blood and the sun will be darkened before that day arrives. What day? The day of judgment. And it's not a day, the day of judgment. When you look, actually go to the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter, the 12th through the 17th verses where, where this is recorded in. John says, and this is the blowing of, of uh, one of the, the, no, no, I'm sorry, it's not, I back up. What John sees here in Revelation 6, uh, 12 through 17, it starts off with a great earthquake. And John says, uh, the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon was turned to blood. And the stars fell from heaven like when a, tr a great wind blows unripe figs off of a fig tree. And he goes on to say, And the island groups and the mountains were removed from their places, and the, s and the heavens were rolled up like a scroll. Now, what John might be actually seeing here may have been maybe the same event that w came during the ninth plague when Yahweh told Moses, Raise your hands and command the sky to uh, command the sun to be darkened. And the account says instantly the sun became darkened, and the darkness lasted for three days. And all those in in Upper Egypt groped, but those in Lower Egypt, was, which is where the Israelites lived, they had illumination. It's also where the it's also where the Great Pyramid of Giza is. 
they had illumination in their homes, the scripture says. Interesting. Anyway, uh, could this be Planet X, Nabooru, what we've been told about coming again? Chances are yes. John goes on. He said that the, the kings of the earth, the military commanders, the mighty men, and their servants, essentially, uh, he said the, 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 the free men, the rich, the poor, they all cried out to the mountains, and they cried out to cover us over, to hide us from the wrath of, the, of he who is sitting on the throne and from the Lamb. Could this be the final event? Hmm. We're living in a time of prophecy, and they are coming about. Well, what do you mean? What did Jesus say? There would be earthquakes in one place after another. Oh, we've always had earthquakes. Oh, yeah? You can document this. Starting in 1998, earthquakes instantly seemed to increase 500% over the previous 100 years. Now, people say, oh, we got better recording methods. Well, that's great, because since 1998, they've increased to seven, over 700%. Earthquakes don't come one at a time. They come in swarms now. The earthquake event at Fukushima wasn't just one earthquake. It was over 17,000 earthquakes that lasted six months. Over 17,000 earthquakes were triggered by the Fukushima earthquake, which may have been a, a man-made event. Uh, last year, last uh, a year ago, last April, I believe it was, there was an earthquake in China. It was a 7.4, I believe is what it was recorded at. Uh, it lasted a week. It wasn't just one earthquake. It was over 4,000 earthquakes, and the authorities couldn't get into where the, the affected area because the earth wouldn't stop moving. We just had several large earthquakes go off uh, down in South America. Uh, and for those of you who live in Oklahoma, you have had at least one earthquake every day north of Oklahoma City for about the past six months. Mostly due to fracking is my guess. But there's been more than one earthquake north of Oklahoma City a day for the last three months. I've watched them every day. There's at least two, three, four, five earthquakes that are happening almost every day north of Oklahoma City. So, there you go. Wars and reports of wars. Wars and rumors of wars. Almost, oh my goodness, there's conflict all over the place. you got conflict everywhere from Libya right, right across through uh, to Japan. Seriously. Uh, right across, right across, there's not a country that's not in conflict. Uh, virtually not a country that's, that's not in conflict. Look at the wars that we had gone on because of 9-11. We, we finally extinguished the war in, in, uh, in Iraq, but that doesn't mean it's over there. Every day, somebody gets, bl gets blown up in Iraq. Uh, the same thing for Afghanistan. That's still going on. And Afghanistan's a joke. Everybody knows that Afghanistan has been run by the CIA since Russia was in there. We laughed back in the 80s and 90s because it was Russia's Vietnam. Ha, 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 ha. You're getting your butts kicked by a bunch of, of cavemen. Well, when you look at what happened in 2001, those cavemen, the Taliban, eradicated opium production in Afghanistan. Yeah, nasty old Taliban. Hang on just a moment. Station break. We'll be right back with Peter Kling. Discover what's really going on in the world that mainstream media won't tell you. At Truth Radio, you can listen live or listen to a large selection of archived programs. TruthRadio.com. The truth is out. If you've always wanted to understand a little bit more about law, but not make a deep study of it enough that you would uh, get a degree or be admitted to a bar, but you'd still like to know just a little bit more than you have earlier learned, here's the perfect solution for you. 
we have received a number of copies of a booklet entitled The Our American Common Law. This booklet is written by Howard Fisher and Dale Pond. If you'd like a copy, this just under 30 pages will uh, really give you a practical grasp of what the common law is and how it fits into your daily uh, affairs as it relates to courts and jurisprudence. Our address is Post Office Box 344, Nepomo, California, zip code 93444. No price, just donate to Truth Radio. We'll send it to you. Thanks. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. All right, we're back, and let me put in a little uh, commercial break for me. Folks, I, I, uh, I work on a real tight budget, and my only form of transportation is in the shop right now. The bill will be about $1,500, and I need your help to make that. If you can go to freeamerican.com and tap on any one of the donate buttons there, Send whatever you can. Even if it's just a dollar, it lets me know you're listening. It lets me know you want to help. And, uh, you know, I, I don't take advertising on here. I've got now, I do have advertising. I've got Peter Kling's book up there, right up there under the show. And uh, you've got the links to his website. I tell you about people that I think are worthwhile. I tell you about the books that I think are well done and that uh, give you the information that you want. The mainstream news, and the reason I started this over 20 years ago, back in 1994, I started this radio show and the Free American Magazine because I was outraged watching the government stormtroopers, the BATF, murder 17 little children and their families at Waco. And the press was not telling you the truth. The press has never told you the truth. And that's what I try to do. I try to bring the truth to you. Because I believe the Bible tells you the truth will set you free. And Peter, it's been very, very difficult to do. Because uh, right, uh, even right now, I had, uh, I, I've got several stories up and uh, films up that I thought were worthwhile and people should know about on my Facebook and uh, you know I've got your your information there your website there uh, on the Facebook got a picture of your book there letters to earth you can survive Armageddon and uh, <laughs> before that I had put up a article a film actually called The Truth or, or the, the Greatest Story Never Told and that was a, about an hour and a half film of the story of Hitler and I don't believe we've ever got the true story of Hitler because our press has been co-controlled by the Pharisees and uh, they've demonized Hitler the same way they tried to demonize me. Oh, Clay Douglas, he started the militias. Well, yes, sir, I sure did. I did in the governor's office. Wasn't exactly a terrorist organization. And uh, I went, uh, had a friend, so I, I this, this is like first-hand information of what we're up against. Again, my motorcycle, the sole source of transportation is in the shop. The donations have not been coming in to cover the cost to get it out. A friend, our neighbor, offered to give me a ride to the post office. On the way, I casually mentioned I'd put up a film I thought everyone should watch, The Greatest Story Never Told, The Story of Hitler. He exploded and the conversation ended. He was a murderer. You could not, he would not allow me to say anything in defense of Hitler because I have that film up on my site, freeamerican.com, and my donation num num button nearby. Judging from my friend's reaction, this may be the reason I'm not getting more donations. This is a real dilemma for me. I'm trying to educate Americans about the whole New World Order, Zionist-run global government, but nobody wants to hear it or support those of us opposing it. 
the question is, so who are we trying to save and why? And very close to this, uh, I, uh, I've, uh, I, I also, just as kind of an addendum, I put up news from our FBI, some FBI files that said Hitler lived. <laughs> so, so uh, and the FBI covered for him. Of course, uh, you know, uh, Hitler is uh, tried to blame, be uh, blamed for six million Jews dying when 60 million white Christian Russians were killed by the Bolsheviks, Stalin and Lenin. And uh, so, so in, in asking who, 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 are we, who are we doing this for? Why, why am I doing Why have I put my life on the line? They've tried to kill me several times because I referred to uh, building number, I put building number seven on the cover of my magazine back in uh, March of 2004, April they everybody's phones were tapped the New York uh, Times revealed that and May 20th 2004 10 years ago I called home to ask my son where am I going next where do you want me to go next son he gave me directions and somebody was waiting for me two blocks before my destination t-boned me on the motorcycle and they kept me drugged for three months in three hospitals for three broken ribs three quarter million dollar hospital bill for three broken ribs and basically I lost everything I've been trying to put that back together again and who am I doing this for you know nobody it's like nobody wants to support anybody oh you're a radical oh you're a racist oh you're anti-semitic oh you're you're anti-government I'm not anti-government I'm the most pro-government guy you got out there I just want the constitutional republic guaranteed us and our founding fathers and our founding fathers warned us if you ever allow a private bank to issue your money the banks and the con and the corporations that spring up around them will leave your children homeless in the land we conquered I got a feeling this is almost biblical the uh, Bible has told us you will forget who we uh, who you are and uh, I've got guests that I have on that talk about Christian identity they say we, us white folks, Caucasians, we crossed the Caucasus Mountains to escape from the slavery in the Middle East. We, uh, we turned left. They started calling us Caucasians. And a lot of us ended up in Germany. Now, is that a, um, do I have a whole made up false view of our history, of our documentation, doesn't the Bible say you'll forget who you are? And haven't many of the Christians out there forgotten who they who they are, where they came from? I mean, I, I simply don't buy into the whole idea that the so-called Jews, as a, a Jewish historian referred to them as, I don't buy that uh, they are God's chosen people. I think God chose me and you. You're getting the information out. You're trying to tell the truth. I think you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to, you're, you're, you're one of the Israelites. Am I wrong on this? Am I, am I somehow got a, uh, have I succumbed to delusion? Or am I closer to the truth than most people? You want me to answer that, Clayton? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. It, it actually might go back further than that. Uh, you bring up a, some good points, and I'm going to connect a, a bunch of things together here for All you. All right, sure. I'll sit down. I got but my but coffee me, warmed up. I'm ready for you. We, we can go back to, again, go back to Genesis. You see, everything takes us right back to Genesis. People ignore it. They ignored the information, and, the, and religion will never teach you the information. Einstein said, science without religion is lame, but religion without science is blind. Now, would you rather be led by a lame man or a blind man? Hey, interestingly enough, I came up lame in one of the races. 
<laughs> yeah, I had my knee broken in three places in a death dealing event, an event that should have killed both me and my son. A truck decided it needed to make a left hand turn in front of my car. It did not end well for the car that, or me or, or my son. We all kind of got injured in there, but it should have killed us, and it didn't. That's the great part. Um, we, we both agree that, thank God, we are still alive. Um, the last time that I had a situation like that happen is even more incredible. But here's the thing, Clayton. You go back to Genesis, and what is it? Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy. Uh, it's, uh, this is after they, you know, they ate the fruit, and they had a state change. They went from alpha into beta, and that, that is documented there. That is documented. We can figure this out just by forensics. Just look at look at it and read it. So they, they, they're knocked out of their state of alpha, that love state. They're put into the fight and fight, flight or fight state. And then they're, uh, they're kicked out of the garden. Now, uh, you, you read Genesis 3.15, God, Yahweh says, I shall, talking to the serpent. This is where he starts to hand out it, all, all his, his rulings here because of what happened. He, t he tells the serpent, because you did this thing, you're going to crawl on your belly in the dust, and I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman, and the woman's seed, and you will strike him in the heel, but he will strike you in the head. Now, who's the woman here? A lot of people believe it is Eve. It's not. It's God's woman. A lot of people will refer to Mother Earth as Gaia, but it goes a lot more than that. Yeah, God has a wife. Uh, it, it's essentially uh, the, multi, the multiverse it has the physical aspect and the soul aspect. Yahweh is the soul aspect. The woman is the physical aspect that gives birth to life, kind of like Mother Earth has given birth to all the life on the planet kind of like that same aspect, but on a uh, universal scale. So here, this woman, her seed, a genetic line, which gave birth to the Christ child, which was a perfect DNA union uh, life form, which was told, I mean, go back to the event, uh, an, an interdimensional alien, second time he's recorded in the Bible, or uh, shows up and, and appears to Mary and says, Hey, Mary, guess what? Uh, you've been impregnated with the child of God. Now, it doesn't go into detail how that happened. It could have been something like she was abducted, had no memory of it. They did uh, what they had to do, put her back, and then a messenger went and said, Hey, you're pregnant. Or it could have been uh, a beam me in, Scotty. Think about it. Zygote, zygote being beamed right into the womb of Mary, a perfect human zygote, perfect human DNA. Now read the account, read the Gospels, and look at all the things that Jesus was able to do, and you say, oh, well, he had the Spirit of God. Yeah, it fell upon him like a dove. You go to Revelation, the 21st chapter, the first through the fourth verses, it says that the tent of God will be with mankind. When we are returned back to perfection, when our DNA is restored, we're not going to have a dove fall on us. We're going to have a whole friggin' house fall on us. Think about it. The tent of God will be with mankind. Think of the things that we will be able to do with perfect DNA. Now, I was going to connect a lot of things together. Let's go back to the disciple Stephen. Remember he was talking to the Molech worshippers, and he said that they would be taken far beyond Babylon? Now, this happened after Jesus' death. Now, you've got all the prophecies in the Bible point to two things the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of this system of evil that we're forced to live under. Never talks about the earth being destroyed. Talks about the system being destroyed. Armageddon is not the end of the earth, not the end of the planet, but it is the end of the system of evil, and it will be the start of the end of the prison planet. So here we are. We've got 
uh, this entity here that gave his life for us, and, and then some years later, Stephen says that uh, the Molech worshippers would be taken far beyond Babylon, and we have the prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem. And what happens? In 67 CE, the, the, the Roman army comes in, surrounds Jerusalem, undermines the temple wall, and comes up inside the most holy of the temple. The thing causing desolate, the thing of abomination which caused desolation was standing where it ought not. The Roman armies were standing in the most holy of Yahweh's temple. But for some reason, they packed up and left town. Now, all the Christians who were, now, now they, they were there for the, the Hebrew Passover, the Jewish Passover, when they saw this, they left, they left Jerusalem. They left Judea. They fled to the mountains and became the seven congregations. Now, three years later, General Titus, later to become Emperor Titus, comes strolling in with the armies right at Passover and surrounds the city of Jerusalem with over two million Jews in it. According to the historian Josephus, uh, the siege lasts for three months. Think about two million people in a city that was never meant to hold that many people. Starvation was the first thing to set in, and women were eating their own children, according to Josephus. Yeah, when their children died, they ate them, just to stay alive. When, jo when Titus finally laid siege to the city and raised it, over two million Jews died, and he took ni about 93,000 captive back to Rome. Who would he have taken captive? The elite. Those who were most healed. Those who were in charge. Those who it would be most insulting to to become a slave. And they were taken back to Rome and sold into slavery. And everybody thinks, well, they died as slaves. No. The fact is, the vast majority of them bought their way out of slavery before the end of the first century. The oldest Jewish settlement on the planet is in the city of Rome, like little Jerusalem. It was set up in, uh, I believe, in 68 B.C. as a trade city between uh, Israel and, or Judea and Rome, and it's been there ever since. No doubt those captive had a lot of help getting them out of captivity. Now, what happened to them after the first century? Well, we really don't know. You see, we have to assume that they assimilated themselves into European society. Uh, there's an interesting movie, Ivanhoe, which came out in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, if you get a chance to watch that movie, it's really interesting. It happens during the, the time of the night of the uh, Crusades, and it shows the uh, intimacy between the, the uh, European Hebrews, who were controlling the gold, and the royalty back then. Now, just around during the same time, or actually just before the Crusade, somebody thought it was a really good idea, somebody in the Vatican thought it was a really good idea to capture Jerusalem. And so, about a thousand years ago, uh, the, uh, the Vatican started, or the Church, Holy Roman Empire, started putting together an army, and uh, in that army was the Knights Templar, a little-known order of knights from France, I believe, that stepped forward. They were really poor. They had to have two knights riding one horse, so the story goes. That's why their symbol is, you know, two, two knights on a horse. Wait a minute. Knights are part of royalty. They are, you know, the, the, the people that report to the king. There, is no, there are no poor knights. They all have land holdings and money. So who are, why the two knights on the same horse? Let's take a look. Could, they, could it mean two entities ride on the same horse, riding in the same direction? Well, what happens? When the Knights Templar get, for some reason, they go back to Jerusalem, they kill everybody, man, woman, and child, Christian, Jew, Muslim, doesn't make any difference who they were, they put them to death. And then they started digging. What were they digging for? Better question, how did they know there was something worth digging for. Who buried what there? Well, the last people who would have buried something on the Temple Mount would have been those Molech worshippers during the first century uh, while the siege of Rome, or Titus, was going on. They were the only ones that would have had the opportunity to bury 
what was ever buried, and their descendants knew about it, got to the point of where they were able to go back and get it. So what was it? Was it treasures? Yeah, maybe. But more importantly, it was knowledge. It was that knowledge that came out of Egypt. Remember, these are Molech or worshipped Molech from the time they left Egypt. That's why there's a pyramid on the back of your money. That's why there's an obelisk to Ra that sits in the Vatican. That's why the Washington Monument is an obelisk. They're all penises of Ra. Are you familiar with Ron Wyatt's discovery of the Ark of the Covenant beneath the... I uh, uh, you know, I, I am familiar with it. I don't know whether I believe it or not. It is very possible. If it was there, it would make sense that it was... It, it, one thing's for sure. The Babylonians didn't have it, and they came in around 600 and, laid, and raised the city of Jerusalem. There was no record of the Ark in the Babylonian uh, uh, re uh, record of all the things that they took. Uh, uh, and we can be pretty sure that the Ark vanished before Babylon came in, because I believe it was uh, King was it Melchizedek, I believe it was, that had, uh, he was a Baal worshiper. And he actually had an obelisk, a penis of Baal, put in the most holy of the temple. Now, the priest couldn't have done anything to change the king's mind, so no doubt they took the Ark out and hid it. They put it somewhere. Nobody ever, nobody knows exactly where it went. Now, Ron saying that he found it under uh, uh, the area where Jesus was actually uh, impaled and that Jesus' blood actually dripped on the ark, well, I can't say, nah, it's a bunch of crap, because I don't know. But I also understand that Ron had retracted that whole statement before he died. So I don't know, you know. I, I hadn't heard they, that. You know, they, they manipulate the truth. You yes. know that. Yes, sir. And when you're on your death deathbed, and if you have any surviving relatives, they can tell you, "Hey, you want your relatives to live? Say this: you're dying anyway." You know, that's an old <laughs> that's an old tactic that the Romans used to use. You want your family to live? Here, go commit suicide. They, that same tactic has been used on me after I got out of the hospital and after I refused to take the drugs that they tried to force on me. I I lost my whole family over that, you know. So I, I'm aware that that's a tactic they use. Yeah, it, I, if you're not under attack, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that simple. I, I told the uh, I told the doctors. I said I'm not taking any of this medication. I'm not taking any of this anymore. The only thing I need is a joint and a Harley, and I'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> is it, hey, you know, if you're happy, you'll live a lot longer. And if you don't, you'll die happy. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> you know, being under suppression regardless, uh, or oppression, regardless of what it is. Nobody is happy because we were born to be free. We were born to enjoy a certain amount of God-given freedom, and they're taking more and more and more of it away from us every day, and they're putting people to sleep by watching the idiot box. Oh, who's dancing with the stars today? That's you're right. going to be dancing with the stars tomorrow because you ain't never going to live to see, live through the night to see the coming of the kingdom of Christ. It's just that simple. This is the uh, all-seeing eye. The, the uh, television you're watching is the greatest tool for mind control. And I've, I've said they've, they've actually. Uh, what did I lose here? Did I lose something? They've actually refined the art of slavery to the point the slaves don't know they're slaves. I'm not a slave. I can go get my pickup go get a beer. It's called economic slavery, dummy. It, if you're watching the TV, there's a reason why they call it programming. programming. <laughs> yeah, it's re... You shut the TV... Now, Clayton, I watch TV. But when I watch TV, 
I don't sit there and, and go into idiot mode and say, ah, oh, this is cool. You know, I'm looking at it and I say, wow, look at the programming that they're putting across to the, to the kids today. Or looking to look at the programming that they're putting across to the people. Uh, look at how many alien shows have popped up on the TV over the past three years. You think they're telling you something? Yeah. How many people do you see murdered, tortured, killed on television every hour? I mean, I think, it, the, I think the, the average child watches 36,000 murders a year if they're watching TV. It's, uh, so it's okay to kill. Even in car, you know, the, the greatest thing is killing in cartoons. You have adult cartoons like Family Guy and and and, and uh, The Simpsons and, and uh, uh, several others that are better out there. Great entertainment. Yep, oh, American Dad. Let's see. We well, got a homosexual alien. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess he's actually tra uh, a uh, transsexual or is he bisexual? I'm not sure. But you know what? It's the perfect metaphor for set. You got a government agent that's dumb as a stick working for the CIA. And you were watching it, being entertained by it. Oh, isn't this funny? So are your kids. But now let's go back to the Knights Temple. So what happens? They, 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 they find this secret information, and we see that in the next 300 years, roughly, they transform Europe from edifices of wood into edifices of stone, the likes of which have not been seen since the early days of the Roman Empire. They set up a banking system, which our banking system is still founded on. Every banker will say, oh, well, our banking system is set up on the Knights Templar. Yeah, where you give them your gold, and they are, now they keep it. And they give you a little bit of gold back along the way. And they say, well, we've got, a, we've got $10 million worth of gold, uh, we'll lend you $10 million. And they lend everybody $10 million based on the gold that they're holding. So by the time they're done, they have $100 million lent out. They only have $10 million to show for it. And now they want the debt paid. You see? And that's where we are today. They're, low, they're giving us money on money that doesn't exist. It's fake. It's not fair. They're pulling it out of thin air. It's numbers in the computer. It's printed on paper that you can wipe your butt with before too long because the dollar is collapsing. You don't believe me? Go to the grocery store. Buy some groceries. I go into sticker shock every time I go in the grocery store. A year ago, chicken, uh, a boneless, skinless chicken breast cost me two dollars a pound a year ago. Now it's three dollars a pound on sale. That's a third. That's one third. Man, I wish I had a pile of chicken breasts. I could have made 30% on my investment in one year. And you want to you, you want to turn around and find a good investment? Get your money out of your 401k plan and buy food and store it. Well, you know what? That's a, that's a, one of the solutions that I proposed. I mean, I've been talking about this whole new world order. You know, now we can see a new world coming into view. Uh, I've been talking about that for 20 years. And about 10 years ago, and this may be a part of the reason they tried to kill me, I came up with an answer. I said, how did we live 100 years ago? How did we live 1,000 years ago? Richard Kelly Hoskins said the basis of every civilization is the self-sufficient family farm. And I think he said that 20 years ago. And Why did they call it a victory garden during World War II? And now if you try to grow your own food... They turn around and tear your ground up. That's right. That's right. And uh, I've told people that any time a communist regime and every plank on the communist manifesto is intact and functional in America today. Every and, and plank. I believe, I believe it's either in Washington or Oregon. You do not own the rain. You do not own the water. Colorado. You are not allowed, you, you are not allowed to collect it. You are not allowed to dam it up. It, or you are not allowed to turn around and put a bucket outside and, and, get it, and let rainwater fall, for, fall in it and put it on your garden or wash your face with it. That's right. That's right. And my home in New Mexico had a cistern there, probably a 500-gallon cistern that was there for 75 years. It's a... Uh, they they have uh, 
They've tried to close down family farms up in Arlington, Texas. There was one small group up there, people they called the uh, Garden of Eden, and they were growing their own food and feeding their neighbors. Jackbooted thugs came in, stomped on their tomato plants, put them in handcuffs, didn't arrest anybody, just harassed them because they don't want you being able to feed yourself. Anytime a communist regime, totalitarian, let's call it totalitarian because you don't know what's communism anymore. And frankly, I can't tell whether uh, we're under communism or fascism, and I don't think it makes any difference. It's like saying, well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Well, it's two wings of the same bird, and that bird's a global vulture, it's not an eagle, flying free. They go after the farmer. Like are you an idiot or are you a fool? <laughs> <laughs> they got, they got... They go after the farmers first because they don't want you to be able to feed yourself. And let's expand that to farmers or ranchers. If you're named Bundy and the BLM is in there killing your cattle, oh, they're going after our food supply. If you, uh, if you uh, live on the Gulf Coast and your shrimp and uh, catfish has been soaked in oil from BP, they're going after your food supply. Second, they go after the intelligentsia. That's any of us that are smart enough to know what they're doing, or well-read enough to know what they're doing. And third, they go after the veterans and the law enforcement that might still be loyal to the old regime. All those bodies you saw stacked up and uh, said they were in Germany or said they were in Poland or said they were in the Soviet Union, those were probably the police and uh, soldiers that were still loyal to the Tsar. Hard to tell, uh, yeah, hard to get an idea off of a dead body. <laughs> well, you know, you brought up a, an interesting person earlier, Adolf Hitler. Now, uh, you know, it's interesting. My father, when he was, well, my, my, his, my, but my dad's side of the family from Germany, they immigrated into the United States. Interestingly enough, when you start going back and looking at my family history, they immigrated from France into Germany first because of persecution by the church. When you go back far enough, uh, my family were among the first to start to raise up against the Catholic Church. And here, I, <laughs> this is all research that my cousin did over in Europe, but, uh, they, you know, from what he found out. And it's crazy. Here I am a thousand years later doing the same thing, but not just against the church, against the evil of this world against the controls that are forcing, that have forced us into slavery. Adolf Hitler, my, my dad got to see Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler did great things for Germany. Yes, he the did. At the same time, the same time, FDR was doing great things for America. Uh, oh, they, you they mean like taking our gold? Into, stealing our gold? Well, he, hold on. They both came into power in 1933. Yes. Now, yeah, FDR. Now, y y you want to know the FDR connection? The Roosevelts own the oldest bank in America. It was the Bank of New York. Now it's Mellon Bank, Mellon, uh, bank I believe is, is what it's called now. Uh, the Rothschilds owned, at one time, owned the second oldest bank in America. It was the Bank of America. It was actually the first bank. It was the Bank of America at that time. Uh, they didn't re get their charter renewed in 1811, and we got... The War of 1812. You ask any anybody, so why did the War of 1812 start? Uh, I don't know. Well, it started because the Rothschilds went to uh, the king, the king of England, King George, said, "You want your colonies back?" Because they didn't get their charter for their bank renewed. The war ended in 1815, and in 1816, the Rothschilds got the second Bank of America, and uh, it was Andrew Andrew Jackson's prime goal when he was president to put the bank out of business. It stayed, he, and he was successful. He ended the Rothschild grip on the banking institute in America. They snuck back through uh, by marrying other banking families. When Lincoln went to go get a loan from the banks of Boston to, to finance the war, they said, sure, we'll lend you all the money you want, 25%. Lincoln said, screw you guys, I'm going to the Treasury Department, we'll print our own money. So he assassinated Lincoln. Now, interestingly enough, you brought up uh, an interesting point. Over the last hundred years, all the people that have been killed, well, uh, this actually goes back to something that started in 1814, 200 years ago. Uh, 200 years ago, 
the Rothschild family who had financed both Napoleon and Wellington, who had captured the financial system of France, Germany, and England. They own, they owned the, or controlled the Bank of England, and they captured that by having insider trading information uh, when Napoleon was defeated by Wellington. They knew the day before, and so they started selling all their war bonds. People panicked, and so the, everyone sold their war bonds, and slowly uh, the uh, Rothschilds started buying them back up once they reached rock bottom. They made 20 to 1 on their money when the real news came in. So they bought all these war bonds at, at low, low prices by the time it was all over. You, you ever watch Trading Places, the movie with Eddie Murphy? That's yeah. based on the Rothschilds' insider training of capturing uh, the Bank of England. And they, once the Bank of England was captured, they said, I don't care who is sitting on the throne. As long as I run the bank, I run the country. Who owns the Federal Reserve? It's the Rothschild cabal. The Rothschild Bush cabal. They own... Uh, don't the forget the uh, Rockefellers. Major ownership in the largest banks in the world. Yes, don't forget the Rockefellers. They certainly got uh, a large Absolute, percentage of that. Absolutely. They're all, in, they're all in it together. They're all part of the same cabal, Rockefeller, Bush, and, and Rothschild. And that... As a matter of fact, it, it was Bush, it was Prescott Bush that was funneling money to the Nazis prior to World War II, or up, and, up through World War II. 1941 is when he was arrested for lending aid to the enemy. Uh, he had all his assets seized. How does a how do you how do you become a how do you get arrested for, and have all your assets seized for aiding and abetting the enemy, and then go on to be a state senator, have your son to become CIA director and president, and have your grandson idiot idiot at large become president, and then they bring in the bar from the CIA. You know, I I yes, did that was a racist comment. I do apologize for that, but you know what? Obama is nothing but puppet du jour. Who can pull the strings is who he reacts to, and his biggest connection is back to George Soros, a Zionist. That's right. That's right. Well, and I did that in my book. If you're working for the master, what does that make you? In my book, Mystery Babylon, The New World Order Unveiled, over 25 years ago, I got a hold of a pretty much top secret document that detailed the Operation Watchtower. That was George Bush as CIA director. He sent Colonel Edward P. Cotolo down to Columbia, sent his team down there, special operations, including somebody that became a friend of mine, William Tyree, doing life in Walpole prison after they murdered his wife, framed him for the murder. George Bush sent the uh, special forces down, they built radio towers. The radio towers were used to bring over 100 planes into Albrook Air Force Base where they were met by the Mossad my, uh, and uh, the CIA. Michael Harari from uh, the Mossad was controlling Noriega. They brought in 100 plane loads of cocaine. That cocaine was shipped up to uh, from Albrook Air Force Base in Panama were shipped up by Barry Seal, flown by Barry Seal to a little protected airport called Mena, Arkansas. I and want to confirm your story. A good friend of mine who uh, actually was an Army Ranger once upon a time, very loyal American, he was attached to the CIA and he was part of the crew that used to have to load and unload those planes. Yes, sir. When I, I never saw this man angry in my life. Never saw him angry in my life. Actually, I wrote about him in Letters to Earth. Um, I, when I found out that little fact that you just mentioned, it's probably, probably about 10 years ago, I guess, by now, almost 10 years ago, uh, I brought that up to him, and first time I ever saw this man get angry, he gritted his teeth, and he said, I knew it. I know all about that. He used an explanation. He said, I don't want to talk about it. And that's all I got to say. And, and, and I was like, wow, sorry about that. I didn't mean to piss you off. You know, and finally, you know, it was a few years later, uh, he told me all about it. You know, he, he was he was actually, after he finally got all his, his benefits in, in line, and, and you know, he, he's got 
he, he's been rubber stamped from one end to the other. <laughs> so he had to get everything, you know, with the VA cleared and, and make sure he had all the benefits before he started talking about anything. But he told me, yeah, he used to help transport. Yeah, that was his assignment, transport that crap into the United States for the CIA. Yeah, Barry Shields uh, stopped off to visit with me in Dallas and uh, gave me some of the best Oaxacan uh, smoke I've ever uh, had. I just didn't know at the time he had a plane filled with cocaine sitting over there at Love Field that he was taking up to Bill Clinton. And Bill Tyree from his, uh, from Walpole Prison called into my show a few times. And the last time I spoke with him, I told him, well, Bill, I sent copies of uh, Cotolo's document to Bill Clinton <laughs> when, he was, when he was running against George Bush. And Bill started laughing at me. I said, well, Bush is a drug dealer, don't we? Shouldn't we get him out of there? He said, Clinton ain't going to say anything about that. He works for George Bush. And he was right. Clinton never said anything. George Stephanopoulos never said anything. Nobody ever talked about Clay Douglas. Nobody ever talked about Operation Watchtower. And uh, now George has a cushy little job at NBC, I believe. And so they're all in it together, and we know it. And we know it. You know who else knows it? Mm. We'll get to that in a minute. So we okay. talked about the Rothschilds capturing the bank. And, and now, here's the thing. 1913, Woodrow Wilson let them back in. Why? Because they were blackmailing them. Go do the research. They were blackmailing Woodrow Wilson. They got the Federal Reserve reestablished. 1933 comes along, and the two banking families get together, and they steal Americans' gold. They, they buy gold at $20.67 an ounce. They bought over $380 billion worth of it at that, at that price. A year later, Roosevelt changes the strike price to $35 an ounce, and they make 40% on their money, and the U.S. dollar takes a 40% hit. That it was the start of the fall of the U.S. dollar right there. What yes, do they sir. do with the money? Oh, we're putting it into public works. We're going to get America back to work. Yep, just in time for a war. What came out of the war? Ah, let's back up. The Rothschilds, back in 1814, during the first uh, Congress of, of Vienna, where it was, they were trying to figure out how to redraw the lines for all the countries and get everybody up and running again after Napoleon w was going crazy. Uh, he was actually being financed. You know, there's nothing like financing both sides of a war and then, pay, then uh, giving the money out to, uh, lo loaning out the money to rebuild. That's where the most money is, is in rebuilding me. It's all long-term loans. Can you say Halliburton? Yeah, exactly. So anyway, we, we get the First World War. Now, what also happens a hundred years ago? War breaks out in heaven. And Michael and its angels battle the dragon and its angels. But no, room can no longer be found in heaven for the dragon. So down to the earth it is cast. And woe for the earth. For the, for the dragon has been cast down to you, having great anger, knowing it has a short amount of time. Boom. World War I comes. We get the four riders of the apocalypse, only we don't know it then. Uh, we have war. We have famine, food shortage. We have disease after the war with the Spanish influenza. All on unprecedented scales in history. Any historian worth his source will tell you that 1914 was a changing point in history. It also turned war into a mechanized by a chemical event. Now, look at everything that's happened in the last hundred years. But let's look at flight. And I don't care whether you believe we landed on the moon or not. The fact is we launched rockets up there, and we've got satellites up there, and we've got spacecraft that nobody knows about. But in 100 years, less than 100 years, actually, from in, in 60 years, we went from Kitty Hawk to putting a man on the moon. In a few years, we went from the theory of an atomic bomb to producing an atomic bomb. Right around the same time that aliens were supposed to be helping out Hitler. Uh, you know, all of a sudden we have this technology which all of a sudden is all coming through the military, all being given to us hand over fist, and, and we build on it and build on it and build on it to the point where now nothing is impossible, especially when it comes to the biologic. We can create anything manipulating DNA. 
we've unraveled the human genome. We can grow chicken with teeth. Why? To reanimate the dinosaur genes that are still there? Yeah, they actually do this. They, 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 that's how they, they know they can... Uh, the things that they've done biologically, uh, we can't even begin to imagine. It's very possible that there could actually be a cloned uh, alien army waiting to invade the United States. That All may be what they're Operation doing. Blue Book. That may I'm be sorry, what they're uh, doing in uh, in uh, Dulce, in New Mexico, right now, underground. Uh, the, the, the evidence is there. That you know, people have come out and they've talked about a lot of things, especially the military working with extraterrestrials. I'm Did featuring you? that, Peter, in my next issue, the June issue of my magazine. I've got uh, about 50 years of history. I know the uh, aliens are real because my one of my father-in-laws was the Marine Colonel. His name was Colonel Lloyd Conrad, and he escorted the surviving alien from Roswell to Truman's office. Wow. And, and I have said that uh, the reason, and this is uh, this is backed up under Operation Disclosure. I said it kind of facetiously, but uh, it turns out the experts, the people on the inside that have come forward and talked about their plans, have confirmed that I'm right on this. I said the reason that the UFOs are so top secret is they don't want you to know that we could go to the moon and have lunch and be back in time for dinner and never use a drop of gasoline. <laughs> That's what I understand, yep. And now, you know, we're at this critical juncture. We know they're here. And, that, and a lot of people say, oh, well, they're here to save us. Really? Show me one sh shred of evidence. All the evidence goes contrary. Because the 20th century has been the bloodiest century in history. Yes. But between all the conflict and the resulting fallout of the conflict of the 20th century, close to a billion people, close to a billion humans died. Yes. Now, think about that. And we've got all this information which is now coming about. What does it mean? It means we're in time for change. We are going to see the coming of the new... We're going to see the rise of the church, and that's going on right now. Pay attention to, to the current events. I'm going to back up. We're going to cover some things real quick. We, we've well, only got about another ten minutes, I, I guess. Yes, sir, ten minutes. So here's where we are. Uh... Revelation chapter, uh, the, the, the prophecies are, have been fulfilled right down to the, to the big ones coming up now. I'm going to just cover a couple, a few of Revel in Revelation chapter 8. Go ahead. Uh, Revelation chapter 8, uh, starting, I believe it's in verse 6 and 7, where it talks about a third of the earth being burned up. Uh, desertification of the earth, we see that going on now. NASA's got a satellite that just photographs fires on the earth. And then when you look at their, at their photographs, it looks like, a th annually, it looks like a third of the earth is being burned up. Boom, we got that covered. John said uh, in Revelation 8, 8, 9, he says, I saw something like a burning mountain fall into the sea, and a third of the sea became as the blood of a dead man. A third of the creatures in the sea that had souls died, and a third of the boats were wrecked. What he didn't tell us is that BP and Halliburton got blamed for it because that's exactly what we saw during the Gulf oil disaster. We saw something like a burning mountain fall into the sea. We saw what appeared to be huge clots of blood in, in this oil. I never saw brown oil before floating across on the sea, brownish red oil, have you? But we saw it there. We saw these animals die, and a third of the fishing fleet of Louisiana never sailed again. Fat. Boom. That one's taken care of. The next one, the Wormwood Prophecy. A lot of people think this is Nabooru, but it's not. The Wormwood is something totally different. We look what happens. A burning star falls from heaven. Star's a nuclear reaction, isn't it? It falls upon the rivers and upon the fountains. Where do you get your drinking water from? The ocean? No, from the rivers and the fountains. That's where the drinking water comes from. And it says it makes them bitter like wormwood, and it poisons them, and, a th and the men drink from them, and a third of them die. And I give you... Uh, look, look, back up. Wormwood in Russian is pronounced... Chernobyl. 
Now, the Russians were nice enough to cover over their wormwood in, in a month. But the Chernobyl that's been allowed to burn in Fukushima has been going on now for four years. It, 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 we're in our fourth year. We now have four nuclear reactors in China syndrome meltdown. And they're not covering them over. They're just not talking about it. They're, they're just erasing it from the news. These are four nuclear reactors. One of them is filled with plutonium MOX fuel, which has been allowed to burn. And indeed, a third of the drinking water of the Earth has been poisoned with Fukushima radiation. Let's go on to the next one. A third of the Earth, a, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars would not give their light. Why? Chemtrails. Chemtrails block out approximately 28% of the Earth, of the sun's light that reaches the, the surface of the Earth. So that one's taken care of. What's the next one? Whoa, whoa, whoa for the Earth because of the next announcement. And what happens? A fallen angel, a fallen star angel, is given the keys to the pit of the abyss, and he releases what can only be interpreted as an alien invasion on the surface of the Earth. We see horse, the creatures the size of horses with, men, with a face of men, the hair of women, the teeth of lion, and they have t tail, tails like scorpions. And they sting the men, but the men do not die. They only wish they were dead. But death keeps on fleeing from them. Is this some sort of a zombie apocalypse? Maybe. Maybe. We don't know exactly. We'll find out. Because we are in the tetrad blood moon. The moon would be turned to blood. The, this is a very unusual event. This is the first time since we've had the Gregorian calendar that the Hebrew date of Nisan 14 and uh, April 14th lined up. Now, why is this important? In the Hebrew calendar, it's Passover. What's Passover? The foreshadowing of the coming of the Christ, of the Messiah. When did Jesus die? On Nisan 14. And what did he tell his disciples? Remember this date. Keep this holy supper, the Lord's evening meal. Keep doing this in memory of me. And for how long? Until I return. What would be the most logical date for the return of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Interestingly enough, when you read the scripture in Revelation 19, it says that he's coming with the armies of heaven. Armies, plural. Heavens, maybe multiverse. Coming this way. Why? To judge the nations. You continue to read, and another angel calls out to the birds in midheaven, Come feed on the, on the evening meal of God, and eat the flesh of the kings, of the military commanders, of the rulers of this planet, and all of their servants, right down to the freemen, the freemasons. Yeah. Be filled on their flesh. These nations, will be destroyed and the king of kings will establish his rule on this planet what does that mean for us it means a change in paradigm this is the coming of peace on this planet for the next thousand years we get our dna restored you know right now here's some great things i'm going to give you some interesting facts our body regardless of how old you are your body is not older than 10 years your body rebuilds itself every seven, your brain every ten. You are completely rebuilt every ten years. The problem is we have imperfect DNA, and it doesn't make the same copy right every time. You ever go to a copy machine, and all of a sudden your copies start coming out smudged? Oops. Yeah. Time to call the repairman. And we can only give smudged copies of our DNA. So here's this. Here's we're going to have that repaired. Now, once it's repaired, every ten years, we have a new body and new brain. We can live indefinitely. Is the earth going to get real populated? Maybe. Let's take a look at women for a minute. Women. Healthy females are born with over 400,000 eggs in their ovaries. In order to live long enough to use all those eggs, they'd have to live over 35,000 years, which, meant, which means that if Eve was still alive today, she would be 6, year, about 6,000 years old and only 17% through a reproductive cycle. Think about that. So that's the next step. The next step is what happened, we are going to be returned back to meet the prime directive that this earth will be filled with perfect human DNA specimens. The children of God, 
those who make that spiritual connection back to Yahweh and do so in love. The, the beta response of fight and flight is going to get you killed. Stay in a state of love and get close to both Yeshua and, Je and Yahuwah, which is actually the correct pronunciation of the name of God, the Tetragrammaton. Interestingly enough, it was told to me by a Jewish woman who's Christian, who, uh, I should say a Hebrew woman who is Christian, who's an expert, and she's a professor in ancient Hebrew linguistics. I imagine she would know that Yahuwah is the name of God. But it's that connection back to source. It's like going back to daddy. You know, you ever had a bully, you know, my dad kick your dad's butt. Oh, no, he can't. Oh, yes, he can and then you get in a fight and you get and you get hurt and you run back to your dad when you're a little kid. Dad, dad, you were crying on the dad or mom. You know, well, it's kind of like the same thing on a much more spiritual level. We need to make that connection. Interestingly enough, in the book of Malachi, uh, it's the last of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, in the fourth chapter, Malachi says, the day is coming that is burning like the sun. Could this be the Nibiru event? If we have a brown dwarf star that passes between us and the sun, it's like a giant magnet going between us and the sun. It's going to rip off plasma of the sun, and it's going to make the oceans jump, or the water jump out of the oceans. Ninety percent of the people on, I'm sorry, eighty percent of the people on this planet live within ninety miles of the coast. If you live in a low-lying area, and if you can, get to higher ground. You have about eighteen months. Uh, make plans. Get off the coast. Get to higher ground. Store food. It's all coming now. It's all coming now. And Malachi says, the day is coming that is burning like the sun. And to those wicked and presumptuous, they will become as chaff, and they will be burned up, and neither root nor bough will be left to them. Root nor bough. So the whole tree is going to be eradicated. Their family trees will be destroyed. But to you who honor my name the name of Yahweh, the Almighty, to you, the Son, interesting how, the, how it's worded here, Son, S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness with healing in its wings will make you young, will make you feel young like young fattened calves, I'm sorry, will make you strong like young fattened calves and you will go forth pouring the ground and your enemies will become as dust under your feet. Now how does one event destroy the wicked and the presumptuous but make those who have respect for God in his name like strong young calves. You know, kind of like those calves you see at the 4-H shows that the kids have raised, these beautiful specimens, these young bulls. Think about it. That's right. And, you know, that uh, sanctuary that you talked about, getting away from the oceans, getting away from the coast, I, I would like to move, if I can get the help that I need, if I can get the donations I need to get my motorcycle out to be able to relocate in an area that uh, could be paradise on earth, I think that would be the state of Colorado. Colorado yeah. has uh, decriminalized and legalized possession of marijuana. That uh, that's, uh, that's a giant step toward a productive prosperous future, I believe. That, you know, that's the plan of renown, renown in the Bible, I'm pretty sure. Cannabis is the only plant that uh, has a law against it which violates the law of God. That's right. And it's you know, God gave us, God gave us the wind, the sun, and he gave us every plant on earth for our benefit. And I think, uh, I think just uh, growing your own food and generating your own power from the wind of the sun is what God intended. And that's our answer here. We can run the ships on the ocean on the water they float on. We have a great future. You know, here's the <laughs> thing. All right. Hang on, we're out of time here. Media and tell you, are you frustrated with your elected politicians? Get the news behind the news at truthradio.com. At Truth Radio, you can listen live or listen to a large selection of archived programs on demand. Listen when you want to. TruthRadio.com. The truth is out there. All you have to do is open your mind and listen. All right. Let me, uh, we're just about out of time here, but I've uh, still got one uh, 
device recording here. Finish your thought, Peter, and I want to invite you back probably in a week or two. Absolutely. We'll cover some more uh, current events and get into this more deeply. Uh, but here we are. We're right at this point of time where we can turn around and essentially go to the next state. And where we wind up at the end of this, and I'll get it in the next show, I'll talk more about how I know this, where the next step, the genesis that took place on Earth is only the starting point. There are billions, hundreds of billions of planets out there that are just like Earth that are waiting to be populated by the human children of God. With that, I'm going to say, folks, have a great day. Read the letters to Earth because you can't survive Armageddon. Go to my website. You can download a PDF copy of it today. Start reading it. You can do it. Download it for five dollars. Start reading it today, and start living your future. We have a fantastic future ahead. Yes, I'm sir. I'm happy to come back. And with that, I'm going to say love and blessings to all. Thank you very much, Clayton. Thank and you. And I'll be looking forward to joining you again. Thank you. And that this, uh, you feel free to share the show with anybody. It's all up on freeamerican.com. God bless you. Thank you, Peter Kling.